The world is one that is filled with division, division of various kinds. We've almost come to just expect it. Now, there are some divisions that we might consider minor. There are different sports teams and th that sort of thing, and everybody has their favorite. There's nothing wrong with that. But then there are more serious divisions. You think about Republicans and Democrats and independents. There are just different choices in entertainment. There's Apple and whatever that other brand is called, Android. Yeah, do people still use Androids, right? Maybe, <laughs> all right? And so they're just different divisions. And we just sort of come to, this isn't anything new. The world's been divided since Genesis 3. When Adam and Eve transgressed God's law, we're taught in other passages like Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, that sin separates God and man. And so because of sin entering the world, there's a separation between heaven and humanity. But as you just keep reading throughout the Old Testament in places like 1 Kings 12, Solomon had a son named Rehoboam and he would not lighten the load of the people. And as a result of that, there was a dividing of God's people. Ten of the tribes went to the north. Judah and Benjamin remained in the south and you had division. Before Jesus entered the world, we're taught that there was a division between Jew and Gentile and that Jesus' death and resurrection destroyed the middle wall of partition or separation between the two. You know, God wants people to be unified, all of humanity to be unified, and that can only happen in Jesus Christ. A lot of people remember these words, and they remember them because Abraham Lincoln spoke them, but they actually come from Jesus Christ. If a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. That's always been true, and it's true about religion. The scripture reading that was read for us this morning from John 17, verse 20 and 21, it's a prayer that Jesus gave. It's often called the high priestly prayer. As Jesus is heading to the cross to die for humanity, he offers up three prayers. Well, one prayer broken up into three sections. In John 17, 1 through 5, Jesus prays for himself. 6 through 19, he prays for his apostles, those 11, eventually the 12 that would take his, world and take his word and cover the world. But then in John 17, 20, and 21, Jesus prayed for people like you and people like me. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which will believe on me through their word, that they might all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also might be one in us, that the world might believe that you've sent me. And while the world has seen fit, the religious world, to divide into many factions and denominations and different groups, it's against the prayer that Jesus prayed for our ultimate unity. When we draw up the list of why people don't believe in Jesus, we might list evolution, the secularization of our society, and a host of other things. May we never forget to put this one on the list, though, that because the world is divided religiously, it stops people from believing in Jesus, or at least it's an additional hurdle that people have to jump through. And Jesus says... I want people to all be one. Do you believe that unity is possible? Biblical unity, spiritual unity among the people of God, it is possible. This morning I want you to turn your New Testament to the book of Ephesians. And in the book of Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 4, 1 through 6, Paul makes a plea for unity. And that's what we're going to look at, what Paul says about unity in Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. And how can we achieve the unity that God would have us to possess among ourselves and then share this with the world around us. Not to say, hey, we're better than you, come be a part of us. But to say, let's all lay down our prejudices, our biases, and let's become the people that God would have us to be. Now, before we look at Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, I want to do something really quickly as far as the book of Ephesians goes. It'll help us. If we don't have the background I'm going to give, we can still get a lot out of Ephesians 4, but it would be cheapened to some degree. And so we're going to do sort of a brief, I would consider it a two-minute overview, but preachers can't tell time, and so you have to decide that. But I want to walk you up to Ephesians 4 really quickly so that we can appreciate what Paul is arguing for and begging for in chapter 4, 1 through 6. A lot of Paul's letters divide into two halves. Naturally, there is the deep and heavy theological side, and then there's often the practical side. Since Ephesians has six chapters, this happens rather naturally. In the first three chapters, Paul lays down heavy theological truths. That's not to say there's no practicality in them, but they just lay down heavy, deep truths, and we'll look at some of those. And then in chapters 4, 5, and 6, Paul has some practical things to say about marriage, about slaves and masters, husbands and wives, and how do I work on my job and daily life things. And that's all bolstered by what he said in the first three chapters. For example, look at Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. 
according as he's chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Paul says you have all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. Paul starts listing some of those spiritual blessings. Verse 4, chosen before the foundation of the world. Verse 5, Paul says you're predestined. Verse 7, the forgiveness of sins. Paul will just enumerate the spiritual blessings, and he says, now you and I enjoy those blessings because we're in Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, as somebody might begin to swell with pride because they have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, Paul humbles the Christians there and us today by reading to us our spiritual resume in chapter 2, 1 through 3. And you as he quickened or made alive who were dead in trespasses and in sins, where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience among whom we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desire of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Paul says, now you have all spiritual blessings in Christ, but you didn't receive it because you were so great. You were dead in trespasses and sin. Well, how did we receive it? Verse 8 and verse 9 says, by grace have you been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We're his workmanship, his creation, created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God before ordained that we should walk in them. So far in Ephesians, this is what you have. Chapter 1, all spiritual blessings. Chapter 2, we were dead in trespasses and in sins, and we received spiritual blessings by grace through faith. And now notice chapter 3 before we begin with chapter 4. In chapter 3, Paul sort of pulls back the divine curtain and he says, this has always been God's plan to save Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female, all one in Christ. This has always been God's plan. He revealed it to Paul as an apostle and Paul wrote it down. Look at chapter three and verse three. How by revelation was made known to me the mystery as I wrote it in a few words, whereby when you read, you might understand my knowledge in the mystery which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the spirit. Paul says, listen, God opened the curtain. This is what God had always wanted to do. He revealed it to me. I wrote it down. When we read what Paul wrote, we'll know what Paul knew. All spiritual blessings in Christ, chapter 1. Chapter 2, we were dead in trespasses and in sin, but we're saved by grace through faith. In chapter 3, this has always been God's plan. And now chapter 4, when Paul starts to beg for unity, implore, beseech, caution us to keep the unity. What Paul is saying is this, don't mess it up. God's done all of this, not us. It's by grace through faith. This has always been God's plan. And now you Christians, keep it together. Ephesians chapter four and verse one, Paul writes these words. I therefore, the prison of the Lord, I beseech you that you walk worthy of the calling with which you've been called with all lowliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace for there is one body and one spirit, even as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. What does Ephesians 4, 1 through 6 say to us about unity? Number one, put your best foot forward. That's what Paul would say. If we would have true unity, we should put our best foot forward. Look at verse 1. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, the old King James has beseech. It sounds like a pretty harsh sneeze, right? What's a beseech? Well, newer translations say, I implore, I beg. Paul's an apostle. He could command. But I want you to picture Paul on his knees, imploring these Christians. I'm begging you. Endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Endeavor. Give every effort. Do everything you can. It's the same word that's translated in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study or give every effort to show yourself approved unto God. Do whatever you have to do. And that involves walking worthy of the calling that has called us. How have Christians been called? We've been called through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul would say in 2 Thessalonians 2.14, whereunto he called you by our gospel to obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We've been called by the gospel. And now Paul says, walk worthy of the calling that has called you. The quality of our life, the quality of our walk is based upon the gospel with which we've been called. It's sort of a play on words. Called by the gospel, live like that. When an individual has been pardoned a great debt or forgiven a great amount, the expectation is that the person would show gratitude and that gratitude would be manifested through responsible behavior. 
Let me give you an example. Suppose you sped to worship this morning. I know good Christians never speed, right? We always do the speed limit. Suppose you were pulled over doing 85 and a 60 or 85 and a 70. Let's be a little more generous, right? Officer pulls you over. You say, sorry, I'm going to be late for worship. I was speeding, didn't pay attention to what was going on. And the officer says, well, I'm going to give you a warning. I appreciate you being honest with me. Go on and do your best. Do the right thing. Don't speed anymore. What if five miles down the road, same officer, same you, 85 and a 70 again pulls you over. Now, what are you going to say this time? The expectation is that grace and that mercy should manifest itself. If I'm really grateful and responsible behavior, Paul says, listen, walk worthy of the calling, live right, live the right life. Why? All spiritual blessings are yours in Christ. And you and I don't deserve them. We've received them by grace through faith. This has always been God's plan. Walk worthy of the calling. We've been pardoned so much. Our gratitude should manifest itself in responsible behavior. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he were rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be made rich, 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. We've got to live the right kind of life. Sometimes the individual Christian says on a lesson like this about unity, well, my life is my business. And what I choose to do and my habits and what I watch and how I live, you know, that really doesn't affect you. That's just my business. You ought to stay out of it. Paul says, oh, yes, it does. See, when you and I don't walk worthy, when we don't walk in step with the gospel, that corrupts the unity that God would desire that we have. Look at Philippians chapter 1 in verse 27, right after Ephesians. Go to Philippians chapter 1. Hold your hand in Ephesians 4. But I want you to see what Paul argues for in Philippians 1 in verse 27. Because this is involving the worthy walk and being who God wants us to be. Verse 27, he says, only let your conversation or manner of life be as it becomes the gospel of Christ, that whether I come see you or be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Paul says, whether I'm there or not, I want to hear that you're living the right kind of life. One day when I was in preaching school, I went to Dunkin' Donuts. I was coming out and I saw a man on the side of the road and he had a big sign and the sign said, honk for Jesus. And I thought, well, the statistics say that our world's becoming more secular. People don't believe in God anymore, let alone Jesus Christ. But I was at the red light and I said, I just want to see what's going to happen. I rolled down my windows, turned down the radio just to see what, what was going to happen. And honk after honk, bump after bump, people bump their horns for Jesus, you might say. And I, I was rather impressed. Somebody said, no, they honk because the light was green and you were sitting there. Maybe. But I think they were doing it for Jesus. Listen, but this is what we know. It takes more than the bump of a horn. It takes the bumping and the turning of a heart to really live for him. I mean, we've got to change our lives. If we would have unity, we're going to get to the doctrinal aspects. And sometimes we rush to verses four through six and they are there. But there are three verses before them which suggest that there's more to unity than just all of us believe in the right thing. Surely there have been church splits and disagreements among people who all would profess to believe the right things. And so while beliefs are important, I've got to walk the worthy walk. I've got to live the life that says I really am redeemed. Number two. Walk the worthy walk, put my best foot forward. But number two, true unity involves behaviors that unify. That's verses two and three. With all lowliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There are certain behaviors that unify and Paul gives them to us. Do you want unity? I want it. God prayed, Jesus prayed for it. God desires it. Paul's begging for it. If we want religious unity, there are certain behaviors that bring us together. And there are certain behaviors that divide us with all lowliness and meekness and long suffering. Philippians is a sister epistle to Ephesians. And so there are a lot of similarities, like in Philippians 2 and verse 3, Paul says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, no selfish ambition, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Live the life that Jesus lived. Live lowly, be humble, and be meek. I've lived in Florida all my life. I live in Lakeland, Florida now, which is between Orlando and Tampa. But before that, I lived in Hollywood. And when I say Hollywood, people think California, and I've got to disappoint them every time. I mean Hollywood, Florida. And then I say, well, near Miami, because Hollywood is near Miami. And so I've grown up around a lot of Miami Dolphin fans. I'm not a Miami Dolphin fan, thankfully, but there are some. And the Miami Dolphins, they haven't won a game this year, but long, long ago in a faraway land, they were good. 
and in 1972, they went undefeated and won the Super Bowl. And maybe you've heard the story about Don Shula taking his wife after that championship season to a movie theater in Maine for a, a matinee movie in the daytime. And when they walked into the movie theater, everybody stood up and cheered. At which time Shula says, wait, you all don't have to cheer for me just because I won the Super Bowl. And at that time, a young man's walking down to get popcorn. He bumps his wife and says, see, baby, they know me all the way in Maine. And he asked the young man who he was. And the young man said, sir, I don't know who you are. They don't start these movies unless you have 10 people and you and your wife, eight, nine, 10, you put us over the hump. That's the only reason we stood up and cheered with all lowliness and meekness, long suffering. C.S. Lewis said, a proud man will never know God because proud people are always looking down on people and things. And as long as you look down on people and things, you can't see someone who's above you with all lowliness and meekness. You know, the only person who's ever lived who could really beat his chest, the literal self-made man who owed no one anything for his existence, described himself this way. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest for I am meek and lowly in heart, you'll find rest unto your souls. Jesus could have boasted and bragged and said, I've got a relationship with the Father that none of you had, and he does, and he did. But he was lowly and meek, and he says, I want you to be like that. Forbearing one another in love, that is forgiving, being compassionate one to another. If we're going to be unified, we've got to have that behavior. On one occasion, Peter thought that he was being compassionate, and he said to Jesus in Matthew 18, 21 and 22, how many times should my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And Jesus said, he says, up till seven times. And Jesus said, up till 70 times seven. And it's 2019, and we've gotten so sophisticated that we can count to 490. And that's our problem. Too many husbands and wives can count to 490. Too many brethren can count to 490. Too many brothers and sisters. Jesus didn't say that to make us mathematicians. He said it to make us humble people that forgive others that wrong us. If we don't forgive those who have harmed us, God won't forgive us our trespasses. Matthew 18, 35. Paul says lowliness, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another in love. If we're going to have unity, we've got to have these attitudes. Now, look at Ephesians 4 again before we move on to the next point. Paul does say endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Appreciate that. Paul doesn't say go out and make unity. He says go out and keep the unity. I haven't seen it since I've been in Alabama. I've only been here a couple hours, maybe a day or so now. But where I live in Florida, sometimes I'm driving down the road and I get behind a car and I see this coexist bumper sticker. And the coexist bumper sticker is made up of different religious symbols. There's the crescent of Islam, the cross of Christianity. And what that bumper sticker seems to suggest is that we could really have unity if all of you religious people would just give up your beliefs and just give up all. You're the folks causing the division. If you all could just coexist and come, you're all pretty much saying the same thing. See, Paul didn't say go out and make unity. The unity is already inherent in who God is. Isn't that what Jesus prayed? Not just be unified any old way. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, that you, they also might be one in us. We keep the unity that God has already provided. It's come by his grace through faith. It's always been his plan. We just get to enjoy it. In Jude 3, Jude says, contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. We just hold on to the unity. That's already given us by God, the father, through the son and in the Holy Spirit. Beliefs that unify are people that are humble, lowly, meek and compassionate. Number three, there are beliefs that unify. So we've got to put our best foot forward. That's Ephesians 4, 1. We've got to have the behaviors that unify us. That's Ephesians 4, 2 and 3. But then there are beliefs that unify us. Now, up to this point in the sermon, most people in the world at least in the religious world, would agree with what I've said. Live the right kind of life. That's right. Be humble and lowly and meek and forgiving. Endeavor to keep the unity. That's right. But then in verses four through six, this is where the division often occurs. But it doesn't have to. It doesn't. It's not really about who's right. It's about what's right. And can we see the seven ones in Ephesians four and be unified as God would have us to be? I think we can. These seven ones divide themselves up this way, or at least this is how I like to think of them. There are three divine and then there are four human. And so or four that relate to humanity. I typically say underline the ones that relate to the divine aspects and then circle the ones that deal with humanity. So let's go through these. Let's look at the divine first. Look at verse four. There's one spirit. 
There's one Holy Spirit of God. Do you appreciate that? You and I can't be unified religiously if we don't agree that there's one Holy Spirit of God. Acts 2.38 talks about the gift of the Holy Spirit. He gives the Holy Spirit to all that obey him. Acts 5.32, there's only one Holy Spirit who inspired this book. Now, to you, you may say that's a small point. Of course, everybody believes in the Holy Spirit. There's more to it than that. If there really is only one Holy Spirit, and we've got to believe this to be unified like Paul begs, then that means there's only one Holy Spirit. He wouldn't make this side of the auditorium run around the auditorium uncontrolled because they're filled with them. And then this side speaks in languages that nobody can understand except them because it's a private relationship with them and God. And then these people here, they just study the Bible and that's how he communicates with them. Listen, I don't mean to poke fun at anybody's religious practice or persuasion or any of those things. I just mean to say what Paul says. There's one spirit and he indwells all of those who belong to God. Romans 8. And he does the same thing in every Christian. Listen, there is one spirit and we've got to believe that if we're going to be unified. Verse five, underline this. There's one Lord. Jesus is the one Lord. He's the blessed and only potentate, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, dwelling in inapproachable light, which no man has seen or can see. First Timothy six, 15 and 16. Do you believe there's only one Lord? There is. All authority has been given to him in heaven and in earth. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. There's one Lord. That's Jesus. Why does that matter about religious unity? Because of this, whatever the one Lord says goes. If he has all authority, how much is left for me? How much is left for you? How much is left for my grandmother or yours or my favorite preacher or the pastor I heard growing up or all? There's one Lord. There's one boss in Christianity. He's loving and compassionate and kind, but he is Lord of all. He's exalted. He has a name above every name and at his name, every knee will bow. And Paul says, do it before it's too late. Verse six underlined, there's one God and father above all and through all and in you all. This is the Shema of Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord, Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. Love him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So there are the three that relate to divinity, that relate to heaven. Those three, if we're going to be unified, we've got to believe those three and what the Bible teaches. But then there are the four that relate to humanity. Look at Ephesians 4 and verse 4. There's one body. There's one body. We can't have religious unity If we don't believe this now, look at Ephesians chapter one, stay right in Ephesians four. What's the one body? Go to Ephesians one. You don't have to get out of the book of Ephesians to figure this out. Ephesians one, 22 and 23 says he gave Jesus to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. The fullness of him that fills all in all. I know as you drive to buildings like this one or maybe on your way to work or your way home, you see various religious groups, different names, different practices different doctrines, there's only one church. That's not a church of Christ doctrine. No men got together and invented that. No group of men said, hey, it'd be a good idea if we could just get everybody believing there's one church. That's as old as the book of Ephesians. It's as old as Matthew 16, 18, where Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my church. Now, I'm glad churches of Christ, we believe that, we preach and practice that. But if nobody in the world believed it, it would still be true. There's always been only one body, and that's always been God's plan. Paul and others spend half of the New Testament telling Jews and Gentiles, you've got to work out these differences. And part of the reason is there's nowhere else to go. There's only one body. The Jews couldn't go to this corner and the Gentiles to this one. Paul says there's one body. All of the saved are in that one body, that one church. Ephesians 5, 23 calls Jesus the savior of the body. There's one body. There's one hope. Look at that in Ephesians 4. Everybody in the one body has the one hope of heaven. Colossians 1, 5. It's the hope laid up for you and me in heaven. There's only one hope. Everybody's pressing into that one hope who's in the one body, believing in the one Lord. Look at verse 5. There's one faith. That faith in Ephesians 4 and verse 5, that's the doctrine of New Testament faith, New Testament Christianity. There's one body of truth. That means there's one faith. That doesn't just mean, well, that's your interpretation, Hiram. That's what you think. There's one faith. There's one right way to read the New Testament and see what God's saying to humanity. There are areas of opinion and matters of judgment, most certainly. But the things that we must know to be saved, the things that we must know to worship God pleasing, there's one faith. 
Paul says, I'm begging you to stick with that one faith. Don't create a new one that's more convenient for you. Or you say, well, we're different. We come from different places and we look different. And in my culture, there are cultural differences for sure. There's one faith. And then finally, in verse 5, Paul says, there is one baptism. That one baptism puts you into Christ. It's the baptism for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. I know a lot of people say, you don't have to be baptized to be saved. And don't work. Well, listen, we believe in baptism, by the way. We just believe that, well, you, you're saved first and then you get baptized. Or we believe in baptism. We just believe in different modes. And we pour and we sprinkle in these. And who's right? Paul says, there's only one scriptural baptism of which heaven approves. There's one baptism. And an honest Bible student should compile all of the evidence. Look at what Jesus taught about baptism. Go into all the world and preach and disciple the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sins. It's told in Acts 2.38. It's a burial, Romans 6 and verse 4. So baptism puts me into Christ. It's a burial. It's for the forgiveness of sins. It'll put me in the one body. If we're going to be unified, we've got to believe that, the one baptism. Paul says that's true unity. You look at Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, and Paul is telling Christians, put your best foot forward. Live the right life. There are certain behaviors that unify. I want you to be lowly and meek and long-suffering and forgiving one toward another. And then I want you to hold on to these doctrinal things. Listen, people say, we could be unified if you all would just give up your doctrine. And don't you know that saying things like there's only one church or one Lord and one baptism, that really creates the division. Paul would have none of that. He would say, holding on to those things. The things that bind us to the God who gave them. Now, I want to end this sermon this way. If it's that simple, I mean, you've just opened your Bible, you've got Ephesians 4 1 through 6. If it's that simple, Paul lays it out for us that way. Why all of the division? Why are we so divided? Right here in Ephesians 4, briefly, there are some things that are enemies to the unity that God wants us to have. One of those enemies is false doctrine in verse 14. He says, don't be like children tossed to and fro, carried by every wind of doctrine. The truth in love, verse 15, that's what brings us together. When people say things like, listen, we're just a denomination. We might as well get over it. We're just like everybody else. Why don't we just cave in and just, Paul says, that, that tears down the unity that God would have us to give. New Testament Christianity has always been pre-denominational. False doctrine gets in and says, be like everybody else. Surrender your uniqueness in Christ. Verse 17 through verse 20, Paul says an enemy to unity is copycat behavior. We behave like the world. And he says, you haven't learned that from Jesus. You didn't learn that from him. I want you to be different. And then, of course, the last enemy to our unity, Paul would say, it's old men and old women. Not an age, but an attitude. Look at verse 22. Somebody says, Eric, he's talking about old people. Let's stone this preacher, right? No, Paul doesn't mean old and age, but old people kill the church in attitude, verse 22, that you put off the old man, the former conversation. This old man and old woman will show up in different ways. Look at Ephesians 4. It'll be a person that tells lies, verse 25. A person with uncontrolled anger that gives place to the devil, verse 26 and verse 27. A person who doesn't care about supplying the needs of others, verse 28. A person that just says anything out of their mouth, verse 29, grieving the Holy Spirit, verse 30, and then finally losing all control in 31 and forgetting that he or she has been forgiven in Ephesians 4, 32. Paul says, don't let old people kill the unity that we have. Put that old man or woman to death. You, you remember you did it in baptism and do it every day as you put your best foot forward. Christianity is the greatest thing that has ever come into the world. I know that there are a lot of different things going on in our world right now, but the answer to all of those things is the truth about Jesus Christ. And we can unify on that truth, whether we're black or white, rich or poor, male or female. It's always been God's design. We're not better than anybody because we believe these things. We have all spiritual blessings in Christ because of Jesus's grace through faith. And this has always been God's plan. And Paul, by inspiration, is on his knees begging us to keep the true unity that God gave his son for us to have. We invite everybody to be a part of that. Just be a Christian. Do what the Bible says the way the Bible says, and you'll go to the heaven and be with the God that the Bible reveals to us. Believe Jesus is Christ because he is, John 8, 24. Turn from sin, Acts 17, 30. God wants everybody everywhere to repent. Say the same thing about sin that God does. Change your life. 
confess Jesus as the Son of God with your mouth. It's the same confession that God made about Jesus. At his baptism, he said it on the Mount of Transfiguration. And even when Peter confessed in Matthew 16, God attributed, Jesus attributed that confession to God. He said, you didn't make it up. God gave it to you. He's always been the Son of God. Say it with the mouth. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. And then allow your body to be immersed in water. We would love to witness your baptism into Christ, the one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Acts twenty two sixteen, 16, you rise from those waters to walk in newness of life. Join Christians around the world who are in the fight for true biblical unity that Paul begs us to walk in. If you need to be restored this morning, if you've walked out of step with your calling, we all do that on occasion. And God has promised that if we confess and forsake it, the same blood that cleansed us at baptism, it'll cleanse us today. The gospel really is good news. I'm glad to be a Christian. And I hope we can persuade the rest of the world to join us in this endeavor as well. If this is your invitation, come now as together we stand and as we